Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Matt Townsend Show. I'm your host, Dr. Matt Townsend, your guide on the side, your relationship coach. In fact, today we're talking a very specific relationship issue about marriage. Anybody ever met somebody that was married that always had a lot of problems? Apparently that's going around. You know, not all marriages are bad. In fact, Hannah's sitting here saying marriage sounds kind of hard and depressing. Is that what you meant, Hannah? It's because it sounds hard and depressing. And then we said, no, I mean, it's not that hard. Like, (laughs) you know, colon cancer is worse. I disagree. Colon cancer is... It's not that hard. Marriage is not as hard as people make it. But if it. you catch colon cancer early, then you catch, you're fine. Yeah, but if you catch your marriage issues early, it's fine. Nobody Problems does that. Problems in a marriage are not <laughs> negative. Problems in a marriage are opportunities to start the beginning of the end of the marriage. No, no, that's not true. No, that's not true at all because <laughs> problems. I mean, if you're going to end a marriage, you might as well end it super Lee, I don't think that works. See, but see, if you go into a marriage and you see a problem and then that's all you see are the problems, guess what? Then all you've got is problems. But there's a lot of good stuff in a marriage, even if there's a problem or two. You know? Or, or not. Twelve. It's, I'm telling you, if I can get two guys to go scuba diving and be scuba buddies and learn how to manage each other's regulators. Hey, you know what? You know what we did when oh, we went scuba diving? I wasn't talking about we you We did guys. the – yes, you were. <laughs> okay. It is about us this time. Okay? It's not about you guys. No, we did the, we did the assist – like – Assist I took, breathing? The, well, the, well, the assisted um, uh, ascent. So Okay. So I had to take my regulator out and I grabbed Sky's spare and then we went up to the surface. Did, did you actually put your mouth where Sky's mouth had been? No, it was a spare. It was my alternate regulator. That's what it was. Also, we did the thing when your buddy gets tired and he can't swim anymore, and you have to pull your buddy <laughs> Tow along. Tow them around. So we oh, towed neat. each other all over the little. So tell me what, because this is a very, this is a great marriage metaphor, hypothetically, that two guys can be there. You can have an ascent. I mean, our goal is to ascend to the top together, <laughs> right? And sometimes on the way up, you're losing air. So you got to use your buddy's alternate regulator. It sounds just like scuba diving. I'm wondering. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is. It does, where's the where's metaphor? the metaphor? <laughs> well, so like, let's just say, in the midst of all of this, you have a buddy. I don't know that doesn't well, look, pay attention well, to stuff. <laughs> doesn't pay attention. What about what if one of the buddies is constantly nagging the other buddy for his alternate regulator? Okay, good point. Okay, did Sky do that? Uh, did no. Sky bug you? No. Did he talk a lot about food? Uh, no, actually. Is Sky, we got food before we went. Is, so. is Sky a good buddy in the water? I mean, he is, is a he a good, good buddy? scuba buddy. Is he? He is. What would, okay, so this is great. This is a great metaphor for the show. What what makes a good scuba buddy? Um, trust. you got to trust him. Always stays pretty much with an eyesight. Okay. Pretty much. Yeah. So I'm never like, hey, where'd my buddy go? Where did... Is he dead? Yeah. Did he get eaten by the sharks? Do they have sharks where you guys no. practice? Okay. No. They had a little Nemo fish. Yeah. Okay. A little clownfish? It was fake. It was fake. A fake clownfish. A fake clownfish. And they had a fake sea turtle at the bottom. Did they? Well, not at the bottom on one of the platforms. Yeah. Um, and so he's a good buddy because he's reliable? He's reliable. He will kick you in the head, though. <laughs> Does he? Because he doesn't know <laughs> where he is. Well, if Bryce gets too close to my <laughs> to my feet, then I'm going to kick him in the head. Okay. Healthy distance. Okay, so help me, help me understand this. So if you're all the way down there and all of a sudden you can't breathe, is that bad? Uh, catastrophic. Some would consider it. Now, but once that happens, then you'd obviously need what? Air. Yeah. So you could spend hours frustrated that you can't breathe. Or you could move to the air. Did you spend or, hours? <laughs> probably just minutes. <laughs> yeah. You but it, the minutes might feel like years. Yes, dog years. <laughs> so you could spend minutes wondering and mad like, oh, I bet you Skyboy let my air out or whatever and just get mad about the problem. Or you could very quickly move to the alternate regulator and get air. Right? Absolutely. That's what we're talking about on the show today. <laughs> Instead of just getting focused on the problem and obsessing on the problem and dying in the middle of a pool with a fake Nemo clownfish, 
move to Doesn't the it make better sense that if you're struggling for air because your scuba gear is broken, that you damage your scuba buddy's gear so they can't get air, so that that way they can better no, understand that's a great point. why how I'm yeah. feeling of not having yeah. air. Yeah, you hurt them. This sounds like the worst idea ever. This is just what you see in a lot of relationships, <laughs> not even just marriage. But so, I, great point. Has this happened on a date recently? Colonel Sanders. No. I, that's like dating. That's a 500-level course in dating. No, but you could do that with dinner. For instance, if her dinner's larger than yours, you just take some of it away. <laughs> okay. You, okay, that might explain a lot. Right there, like <laughs> why the dates aren't working right now, because you're eating their food. Don't eat their food. <laughs> well, you're not skyboy. I don't know if I get a second date, but I at least get a second dinner. <laughs> <laughs> if you can't get a date, get a dinner. <sighs> you guys are messed up. So the, the name of the show today is about solutions, finding solutions in your marriage and using a kind of a solution-based approach to marriage problems instead of just a problem-based approach. Some of us get too caught up in problems that we overlook the obvious solutions. Okay, That's what we're talking about. And you guys couldn't have done a better job bringing it into your um, scuba world. When is the class over, by the way? I'm pretty sure this is our last one today. Really? Well, then now what are you going to do? Go to Thailand and go scuba diving. (laughs) Together? Yeah, why not? Well, I mean, does, it seems like Bryce pay for me? didn't know about that. Are you, Bryce, let's go to Thailand. Let's go to Are Thailand. your parents paying <laughs> yeah, for Yeah, Thailand. Um, maybe maybe your mom and dad would pay for it. Actually, I am going to Thailand. In oh, May. yeah, you are. Yeah. yeah. In Cambodia? Uh, yeah. Cambodia. And, uh, I don't know, Mauritius? No. Um, Vietnam. <laughs> Vietnam. And Laos. And Laos. And you're taking anyone? No. Well, it seems like if you've invested in a scuba buddy... You ought to take your scuba buddy. Well, there's people I'm going with, and I'm going to tell them to hurry and get scuba certified before then so we can be scuba buddies. So, Bryce, that should tell you all you need to know. He's not committed. He isn't. So I'd He's leaving me for greener pastures. If today is your last chance to swim with the man, keep your eye on him. Okay. Should I swim by my man? Mm -hmm. Okay. Swim by – get another – go get another scuba guy. Go get another buddy. Find find a better scuba buddy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's one think, out there. I don't think there's better out there. Go share your regulator. <laughs> um, hey, guess what happened to me today? Actually, it happened last night. Tell us, Matt. <laughs> um, anybody heard of Adobe? Anybody want to explain what Adobe is? Well, it's when you take straw and mud and you start dancing in it until you have a house. <laughs> okay. That's exactly right. Rob, where know, were you when the 300 years ago <laughs> when the housing market crashed? Because yeah. if I could just dance in mud, and that is a Adobe. House. Can we have someone from the 21st century? Okay, talk Adobe, about Adobe is a high technology company. How high? Like at least a 12 out of 10. <clears throat> wow. Uh, and they have they they have uh, PDF is one of their products, right? The uh, Acrobat. I mean, what's it called? Adobe Acrobat. Adobe Acrobat. Adobe Reader. They have a bunch of tools like that. Adobe Audition. Adobe Audition for audio editing. Uh, Photoshop. Photoshop. So they have all these programs, right? High-tech company, right? Pretty high-tech or well. really high-tech? 12 out of 10 <laughs> in high-techness. Drive by their their facility. They have a really nice brand-new building off of I-15 on my way home. Drive by. You know, they've got weeds and lawn out there they're trying to take care of. A lot of people would hire like a maintenance company with a lawnmower. Not Adobe. Adobe hired, I guess, a sheep herder. And they put, I drive by, it blew my mind. They had sheep mowing their lawn. Are you sure just not being the neighborhood it's in that the fence got This is right around the Adobe building. (laughs) They're sheep eating hay. I don't know what it was they're eating. Weeds. It was not green. Dead grass, maybe. So, hey, kudos to Adobe, who's willing to throw it back a few hundred thousand years. <laughs> Save the environment. It's a really good story, Matt. I mean, Are you going to apply it to marriage now? No. There's no application. None at all? I'm sure there is if we forced it. 
I'm just going to let that one sit. <laughs> okay. Just let people think on that one. Just going to let it brew. I like see what idea. happens. I like the irony. That's just so ironic. High tech company, go get some sheep. Right. It's like it's like putting varnish on your floor and then giving new putting linoleum uh, over it. Well, no, no. <laughs> uh, giving toddlers socks. Say, hey, why don't you scoot back and forth on my floor? And they'll do that for hours. Boom, it's all cleaned. See, or it's all cleaned and it's all it's all you know rubbed in. Yeah. What's the word? Uh, buffed in. It's all buffed know. by your little kids. Well, it'll be polished in two little tracks about the width of their <laughs> legs. Yeah. <laughs> About a foot apart. Well, that's why you get them to do it in different spots over and over again. See, that's just ironic. Anyway, so uh, today on the show we're talking about kind of – it's more – it's positivity, but it's it's taking a, a solution-centered approach, kind of what we call a positive-focused approach to marriage. Okay? A lot of us get caught up in the negative problem approach. You're a jerk. You're rude. You never let me breathe in your alternate regulator kind of approach that's the show anybody got anything to say anybody Matt? Hannah are we in a, Hannah's reading a book <laughs> <laughs> Hannah's reading the book from our guest yesterday we're trying to do a my show my defense here, it's a really good book it's a great book you ought to listen to the show we talked about it yesterday marriage positivity marriage. right um, following are you done reading <laughs> it's a 700 page book he was a great guest by the way Andrew Solomon. Go look at go listen to yesterday's show from Andrew Solomon because again, <clears throat> great spirit there. Okay, Bryce Tobin, you got something for us, dog, for the show today? Hey Matt, how mm-hmm. would you define first world problems? Because I have one here. First world problems would be trying to get rid of your weeds. It, that's actually pretty good. But he they used a third world approach. Well, here's the thing, okay? When it comes to first world problems, if it's a problem you can only have if you have money. We'll feel bad for you. So maybe marriages, some of our marriages problems in today's day and age are first world problems uh, because we fight about dumb stuff. We do. Like we don't get along. Right. Not, not stuff like, you know. Like, hey, did we – let's eat. Should we eat dinner today? <laughs> we don't have any food. Oh, okay. We, we don't see. like to eat the same things. Yeah. Other people are just like, I was happy that we got to eat. You don't let me be me. That's a first world problem. <laughs> what about – here's a good first world problem. I can't vacuum the last three feet of my living room because the cord is too short. Yeah. Where's the positives in there, Matt? Where's the what's the other side of that? Well, you have carpet. You have carpet. You, you have, have something have, worth vacuuming. You have a vacuum. And you got to do less vacuuming than you were planning on. Exactly. See, you can always find the positive. There's always a positive. The negative, there's that foot. And it's usually that foot that has something on it. Right? It's always got like something you a, like a goldfish yeah. smashed into mm-hmm. it. What about uh my <laughs> My commute to work is so short, I have less time to listen to music. Ah! My commute to work is three minutes. My commute to the radio show is three hours. Feels like. So what we're saying is you've listened to some music before you get to here. Actually, I don't even turn on my radio on my three-minute commute (laughs) because it's just too short. On my longer commute, I take a nap. Dangerous, yes. <laughs> but that's how you live. And that's what I need the nap before I get here. That is a first world problem. Three minute commute. Boo hoo. Or what about uh, my new pure my new purebred puppy ate all five of my new pairs of toms. I don't even know what toms are. Girls, do you know what toms are? It's a brand of shoes. It's a Tom Tom is a GPS system. The positive there is now she doesn't have to wear any of those toms. Or she had five GPS systems lying around that her yeah. puppy ate. So. You have a purebred? You paid for a purebred when you could have just gone to the kennel? I won't. Why? Yeah. Purebreds don't last as long, nor are they as fun. That's right. That's what I've been telling Scott. If you want to adopt a pet, just start putting food out on your porch. <laughs> no, 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 no. Have you ever opened open a can of tuna and just leave it on your porch? Seven cats in like 10 minutes. Pick really? the one you want? Yeah, pick the Bring nicest the one house. without a collar. And then Stockholm Syndrome. It just keep it in a closet no. for a while. Only feed. Make sure you're the only thing it sees for about just seven rem- days. Remove the that's collar. poaching. That's illegal. Just Is re- it? Remove, you're poaching. Remove the collar from the cat that you do want and put it on one of the other cats that has uh, yeah. doesn't have a collar. The old that, switcheroo. Well, but if you're switching, you've got to put your name on the collar. <laughs> that way it's yours. Is that the bait and switch? That's the bait that and switch. Bait and what switch. other first world problems? My job is giving us a full breakfast this morning, but I'm already full from eating breakfast at home. Yeah. 
<laughs> and it's not bad, but I understand that totally. Yeah, I'll that come, person. I'll come here sometimes, and there will be donuts, and I'll be See, like, "Aw." So that's a perfect example of us worried about a problem that isn't even really a problem. We do that all the time. That's Look, marriage. Looking beyond the mark. Yes. Yep. So why would we worry about you two drowning tonight? Hey, at least we're scuba diving. That's right. Drowning. At least you're right. having fun. Not everybody gets to scuba dive. And you're trying to take air off of Sky's... Alternate regulator. Alternator. Alternate, alternator. Let's just call it the alternator. It's alternator. alternator. I, could just, I could just suck him dry. I could just push a button, boom. He'll be dead right there oh, in the water. Man. You guys That's can't... trust. You can't fix problems just by focusing on problems. It's time you start focusing on solutions. Boom. That's a first world problem and a first world solution. We're going to take a break. We're coming right back. We're talking uh, solution-focused marriages. How do we create more positivity and more movement in our marriages that are struggling by actually focusing on solutions, for heaven's sakes? Who'd have thunk it? This is the Matt Townsend Show. We'll be right back after this break right here on Sirius XM 143 BYU Radio. Welcome back, friends, to the Matt Townsend Show. Today we're going to get into some solution-focused marriage work. We're going to talk about how to just not get focused on the problem, which you know tends to instill a little negativity in us. And we're going to end up focusing on the, the solution, which is more of the appreciative approach, the, pro, the positive approach to the relationship. But apparently, Bryce, you... Found a loophole? You found a loophole. You think... You think there's something about using pessimism to be positive. Hmm. You're such a Debbie Downer. You're such a negative Ned. Okay, I know it's normally Nancy, but instead of Ned, I had to force the alliteration for a male name. I get these labels from people a lot, and then I wonder if they lived on the planet Earth for very long, or in the very least, if they've even heard of Murphy's Law. My favorite quote exemplifying this from a stage magician, Neville Meskelin. He wrote in 1908... It is an experience common to all men that, on any occasion, such as the production of a magical effect for the first time in public, everything that can go wrong will go wrong. Whether we must attribute this to the malignity of matter or to the total depravity of inanimate things, whether the exciting case is hurry, worry, or whatnot, the fact remains. Still don't believe me? Ever had a first day on the job? Or better yet, a first date? If you have, then I promise you are intimately acquainted with Murphy's Law and don't even try to lie to me. Then what are we to do? We know from science and interacting with other human beings that being 100% negative is unhealthy and no fun to be around. But in psychology, we found this cool thing called defensive pessimism. This is a strategy which involves setting low expectations in risky situations in order to prepare for failure. This is a beneficial and adaptive form of pessimism. This is not a cure-all, though. One study found that it's not good for use in relationships. Now, keep in mind, this study was done with college undergrads who are locked in possibly one of the most volatile dating environments in a person's life. Even still, we know that low expectations in relationships don't do well together. So, at least that makes sense. I can't find an easy-to-digest scientific definition, so I will take you back to a story from my past. I was driving my friend Johnny home. Now, Johnny is prone to loud, animated rants that usually result in loud after that causes lightheadedness among other biological complications. This particular day, he was not having a fantastic day, and he had just dealt with someone who was zealously chipper. So, have you ever stepped on an old cat's tail? Yeah, that's kind of how that went down. He said, I can't stand people who are vapidly positive. I'm negative and I'll tell you why. When I approach a situation and I don't know how it's going to turn out, I default to thinking it won't turn out well because things can either work out or they won't. If I am only ready for it to work out and then it doesn't, I'm left up a creek without a paddle and I don't like disappointment at all. If I prepare for something to go wrong, I'm able to handle it. If it works out, well then look at that. I'm pleasantly surprised, and who doesn't love that? But then there's the positive people. They walk around touting that everything's going to work out and that it's all going to be great and wonderful with unicorns and strawberry yogurt in a sugary happiness explosion. But odd how they have nothing substantial to say when things go wrong. But should things go right, they're always smug about it saying things like, 
I knew everything would be okay, which is a lie unless they can see the future. And if they can, then they can't be very smart because if they were smart, they would be a stockbroker. Now, years later in a social psychology class, I found that Johnny and I were defensive pessimists and there is wisdom in strategic pessimism. So if you know a negative Ned or Nancy, take a step back and figure out if there is a method to their madness. And if you insist on being positive, just don't be smug because that's never an endearing quality. Wow. So I I can't I can be negative, but I can't be smug when I'm positive. Don't be don't ever be smug. Number one. Yeah, that's a great rule. Unless you just proved your wife wrong, then be smug. Oh no! See, but that's how you're going to then ruin your marriage. Oh, that's right. That's how you ruin the marriage. Yeah. So you don't do that. You but you're you're saying there's a there's a healthy reason to be a little pessimistic. It's sometimes it can save you a little trouble. Yeah. And it's not, I don't know, I guess it depends on why you do it. Like, if you do it because you think everything's awful and, and terrible. That's going to no, kill you. That'll kill you. But maybe it'll work out. Maybe it won't. Why don't we settle on the side of, you know, the safe side of things? The Well, see, now that's coming from a pessimist. Yeah. See, the optimist would say, who cares? Either way, I'm happy if I'm happy. Yeah, but no. I mean, either, I might either, be dead, but I'll be happy. Um, Happy dead's not bad. That's, that's better than sad dead, I guess. <laughs> it seems like sometimes if you're the pessimist, you're playing your entire life for the one in eight chance it's going to be bad. I'd rather just play for the seven in eight chances. It's pretty good. Yes, but Matt, is is seven eighths of life good? Yes. Is it? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. I don't know. Because whether it is or it isn't, if it feels good, it's good. That's hedonistic though. That's mm-hmm. if it's good. If it's about feeling. But <laughs> like in the end, seven eighths of a relationship with anybody, there's going to be good stuff. And if you're assuming it's seven eighths good, you're going to look for the seven eighths good. If you assume it's bad, guess what you're going to find? Oh, you'll find bad things if you look for bad things. And it self fulfills bad. And in reality, overall, life's not that bad. Are you with me? I don't know. I don't know. Well, we're going to talk to a pro today that knows. You don't know. I don't. I do not. I'm a college kid. I don't know anything. You're not a college kid. You're about to graduate in December. And <sighs> Thanks, Matt, for reminding me. Bryce is looking for a job. I'm Please give go. us a call, one eight five five chat byu if you've got a job for Bryce. I mean, we're half joking, but seriously. <laughs> no, seriously, call now. People are standing by. Um, we're going to be joined. We're going to take a break here and in a minute to be joined by uh, Elliot Connie who's going to teach us about this approach called solution-focused marriage, okay? It's it's kind of, it's a type of therapy in a way where instead of spending hours talking about everything that's broken and trying to figure out why it's broken, it's the concept of instead, let's just more quickly move right into solutions. You know, in the end, it's the solutions that make things work. Even if we spend 12 years figuring out why it's broken. Why did the car break? Why did it break? What happened? Was it your driving? Were you with somebody? Where were you? Were you driving it off-road, Sky? What were you doing with that car? We could spend hours talking about it, or let's just get the car fixed. And then let's never let him drive the car again. Never. Problem solved. Sky, you're never driving the car again. Okay. (laughs) I'll scuba dive. (laughs) Yeah. He's scuba diving in the desert called Utah. (laughs) We're yeah. scuba diving in one hole. That's all. One yeah. hole. Yeah. I need to move. Yeah, you do. I'd at least go where there's an ocean. All right. Okay. Problem solved. See how fast solved. that was? We didn't <laughs> spend time on it. We just got right to the solution. We're going to take a break. We'll be back talking solution focused marriage right here on the Matt Townsend Show on Sirius XM 143 BYU Radio. Welcome back, everybody, to the Matt Townsend Show. Right here on Sirius XM 143. Today we are talking about marriage, of course, and how you can improve your marriage by focusing on solutions. You know, we just fix Sky's problem driving by you know, not letting him drive anymore. Just get right to the solution. Pulled the car away from him. All that stuff. Right? Yeah, and I liked the solution. It was a great one. That was a good solution. Today, though, marriage. And uh, Sky's nowhere near that, so we're going to... Move on so as not to waste more time there. Move to the solution. We've got a great guest today. Elliot Connie is joining us. And uh, Elliot is a, is 
when it so when you think of therapist, okay, so we go to therapy, we know we need our marriage improved, we need to get it fixed. By the way, a lot of people aren't excited to go to therapy and spend all of this time talking about their childhood and everything that was messed up and what their mom did or didn't do. So it, it freaks people out when they think, okay, we've got to go to therapy, right? So Elliot Connie's our guest. He's a psychotherapist that practices in Keller, Texas. He's the founder uh, and executive director of the Connie Institute, owner of the Uptown Counseling and Family Therapy Center in Dallas, Texas. He's developed an approach uh, called Solution Building Couples Therapy. And he's traveled the world speaking at national and international conferences. He's the author of The Solution-Focused Marriage, Five Simple Habits That Will Bring Out the Best in Your Relationship. You can find out information about his book at thesolutionfocusedmarriage.com. Elliot Connie, welcome to The Matt Townsend Show. Thank you so much, man. Good to have you. And, I mean, I'm a big believer in, you know, solution-focused therapy. Does does it come from – does your approach kind of – Come from like brief therapy, the, the, you know, the granddaddy of solution-based therapy. Yeah, I mean, the solution-focused approach was actually developed by uh, a, a, a married pair, Steve DeShazer and Insu Kimberg, yeah. in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, in the late seventies. I didn't know they and, were married. That's huge. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, and um, you know, now it's a lot of people around the world are kind of doing it in, in, in recent years, you know, I've begun applying this approach to working with couples. Now, they, they call it solution-focused therapy or also brief therapy, right? Yep, solution-focused and, brief therapy is the full name. And But the brief is for a reason. Is it actually faster? Um, yes. I mean, when we do, when we do tests <laughs> and, and through research, when you do therapy in this way, it just typically takes less sessions to get the desired outcome than a traditional psychotherapy. Yeah. Okay. And, and it doesn't mean that there aren't some things that, that we really need to go in deeper on. But teach us then, okay, so there's teach us the different approaches because as couples are out there, you know, trying to figure out, and I hear it all the time, they've gone to counseling. Yeah, I've done counseling. It just didn't work. All we did right. was fight or whatever. Um, tell right. me tell me when you talk about your approach, what, do, what are you really getting to? Solution building couples therapy. What is the difference between that and maybe just a traditional approach? Well, like a traditional approach, you're going to spend some time uh, assessing what the problem is, assessing the origin of of the problem, uh, things in the past that have led to the problem, so on and so on. And unfortunately, those types of conversations are often negative, often involve blaming and biases and things like that. Well, and it it, it comes from Jung, right? Carl Jung that says um, the, the father is... Uh, what is it? The, the child is father to the man, right? So yeah. what happens to us as a child sets us up for what we are as a man. So isn't isn't the philosophy that we, if we really want to understand the problem in this marriage, we have to go back to the the core issues as a child or whatever? That's right. I mean, there, there, we can go back as far as forever right. about what the origins of the problem is. And it's very difficult to get two people to agree on what the origin of the problem is. <laughs> right. Or they might say, that's just a cop-out. What your parents did, come on, we're living today. Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of approaches that are about attachment, you know, things that went on in your childhood mm-hmm. that may or may not have been good for um, relationships, so on and so on. And in this approach, we're going to... Elliot, you there? You know, he probably went into, there's probably a an ozone issue in the Texas area. So we're going to hang on. To or Elliot Connie and and try to figure out you know what happened to him. We'll be right back with him. But one of the keys as you're listening, um, again, we're not trying to downplay traditional therapy. There's a great place and time for traditional therapy. One of the ideas that uh, Insu Kimberg and Steve DeShazer came up with when they got into this solution focused therapy is if we could spend years, days, hours trying to figure out. Uh, a problem, the odds that we, for example, if we're an arguing couple, are going to agree on what happened in the past, it's probably not really high. If we're going to, I mean, a lot of us trying to figure out what happened to me as a child and how it impacts us today, that sounds like a really good idea to just go do in private counseling by yourself. You probably don't need your spouse in that room for that conversation, per se. If we want to, like, create a change in our marriage today, I think what Elliot's uh, working on as far as the solution 
focused approach is probably going to be a lot more effective for us. Is Have we gotten Elliot back on? Okay, we're still looking for you, Elliot. So if you're out there listening, hang on, we'll, we'll get you. So here's the idea. And I think in the end, whatever you talk about is going to grow when it comes to kind of therapy and marriage. And I see couples come in all the time in my office. They sit down and I say, okay, what's going on? And they immediately start with the problem. She never touches me. <laughs> and he just goes off. And he starts giving me example after example after example after example of how lonely he feels not being touched. And she rolls her eyes and says, oh, well, if we would talk, I would touch. But we never talk. And then they get all emotional. And then we talk about how we don't touch. And, you know, 35 minutes into this, what we now know really well is that this is a couple that has some problems. We don't touch. We don't talk. We have a stalemate. We're pretty much convinced that the other's the problem. And we have a million examples of what doesn't work in the marriage. A million. And so we've just spent 35 minutes of our 50-minute therapy session basically reinforcing what's broken. And, um, you know, then we sit there and we wonder, why aren't these people progressing? Well, all we did was rehash what doesn't work in the marriage. By the way, what do you want to bet Everything that doesn't work can change next week. So next week when we have to change the subject and we get into another topic, we could then focus it on something else and then everyone else will bring up their issues. Well, the reason I don't talk is because you don't even listen and we get into those problems. And the idea is the more we talk about the problems, the more we reinforce the problem. And in my own coaching business, I have never seen a marriage improve because we know we're messed up, period. I've never seen it get better because we have a thousand ways to explain how messed up we are. So I'm not convinced that um, the most therapeutic thing you can do in a marriage is to talk about what's broken. Now, inherently, and I'm going to quest. I'm going to question Skyboy on this. Sorry to wake you up there, Sky. What? Um, here's the question for you: When the man, for example, hypothetically says, "She never touches me. She's a prude. She won't touch me." Now, inherent in that statement, which is negative, inherent in in that complaint that the husband won't or the wife won't touch is the problem or is the solution. What is the wife, what is the husband saying he needs more of in that statement? What is the husband saying? Uh Uh-huh. He wants his wife to touch him. More touch. Yeah. Notice how weird this is. In the exact statement of the problem is the the solution. Every time. Thank you. And that is the bell that means an angel just got wings. It also means Elliot's back. Elliot's back. Elliot, welcome back back. to the Matt Townsend Show. Sorry, guys. Having some phone issues. It's all right. We (laughs) thought you got caught up in a hurricane or a tornado down there. (laughs) No, no, no. My phone just decided I don't want to work anymore. That's right. So, Elliot, I just went through and gave an example of, like, couples coming into the office Yep. And you always say, so what's going on? And they immediately jump right into the problem. He doesn't get touched. But I would never say, I would never say what's going on. Yeah, you wouldn't. You'd direct I it. I would not. Right. Right. You, Once, if I were to say that, then I'm inviting the problem into the office. Right. And if I invite the problem into the office, then my job of solution building becomes infinitely more difficult. Now, so check it out. What would you say when they walk in your office? Because it's it's such a subtle thing. Like you don't even have to ask people what's the problem. If you even just said, "So what's going on?" or "What's up?" a lot of times people will immediately go to the problem, won't they? Because they're so conditioned to it. That's exactly right. They're conditioned to it. And after all, the problem is what drove them into therapy. So if you just say what's going on, then that's what they're going to orientate themselves towards naturally. Yeah. So what what do you say when the people come into your office? Uh, I immediately want to get them thinking about talking about and describing what they'd like the outcome to be from therapy. So my very first question is usually something like, what are your very best hopes from being in my office? Yeah. Now watch, you're, and you're pushing them to the positive solution. Well, watch, what, what if they said this, Elliot? What if they said, well, I don't want him to be such a jerk. Uh, what would you rather him be instead? <laughs> See, notice what you're doing. It's so subtle, isn't it? Because you you know how to take it to the positive future kind of state. Absolutely. Uh, I have a friend in, uh, I was just in Sweden last week or Denmark, and I had a friend with uh, dinner with a friend of mine who's a psychiatrist over there, and he calls it a language game. 
Uh-huh. And that's really what it is. I mean, it, it's a very subtle language game that reorientates our language, our descriptions, and our minds towards solutions. And, and it could be positive in the future, like you're saying. So what would you like this to look like? If we really did a great job in our session here, what would it look like? And that's trying to describe a positive future state. You could Absolutely, also go yeah. positive present, right, and positive past. What would it look like today? And what did it? Yeah. What? Where has it worked in the past? Where have you seen exactly that? Those right. good things in the. So you're saying, really, you can take any issue, and formulate it with language into a problem or salute more of a solution, positive focused approach. Exactly right. Yes. That's huge. Yes. But we That's have exactly to overcome right. our natural way of thinking, right? Well, I, to be perfectly honest, I think our natural way of thinking is positive. I mean. You go to a first grader, and he goes to school thinking, I'm going to make a gazillion friends and, and play all day and have a whole ton of fun. Yeah. But some at some point along the way, we somehow lose that, and, and we become very negative. And, and even, I mean, turn on the news, right? You turn mm. on the news, and the stories are going to be, you know, what school bus got blown up and, and what, you know, horrible situation occurred somewhere in the world. But... Early on in our lives, our very natural state is a very spiritual, positive state. Yeah. Well, I mean, and that's... This really just gets back to that. So some of this is just, we've kind of been trained to, I guess, protect our fears a little bit and use our language to make sure we're not getting hurt. But in, in doing so, we end up really killing the deal. Yeah, I think I think we've been we've been trained to fear what's least desired and try to avoid it, yeah. as opposed to identify what's most desired and try to attract it. That's, um, like, and, that's huge. I mean, I that, to, especially in a marriage, huh, where we started absolutely. with such good intentions. Absolutely. I mean, I go to church a lot, and are we, are we in, in a lot of churches, are, 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 is the message more yeah. like sin? how to avoid going towards a sinful life or how to orientate yourself going towards a more godly life, how to get to heaven and avoid the other. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. It seems like that's to... what God would rather have is more godly spiritual people, not just people that sin or don't sin. Exactly. And this is just using language to describe what's most desired, and in particular in relationships, because it's, it's a very powerful thing when you do it in relationships. And then there's the subtle messaging, huh? If, if you ask me, and we do this all the time where— um, you know, I always have somebody that they're mad at their partner and they can't talk to anybody, but they talk to their best friend about it. And then together they basically commiserate. They share the misery of their partners and then they kind of end up self-fulfilling this negativity. Oh. So it, it, it keeps happening and there's no way to change it if that's what we're looking for and that's what we always talk about. Oh, that's absolutely right. Language becomes reality. So if all I'm doing is talking to my best friend and family members – about how horrible my partner is, then all of a sudden it becomes as if that is my entire world. Man, okay, here's one for you. So how would you how would you take this one on? Oh, man, <laughs> Elliot, you know what? He never, he has never, ever, ever done a dish. Not once. <laughs> not one dish. And I'm sick of it. I'm not his maid. I'm not doing his dishes anymore. How would you refocus uh, me? I would ask one of two questions. Number one, tell me about a time when he accidentally did a dish in the past. <laughs> no, we never did. No- we never did. Well, it's, it's, it's very difficult to have a relationship where he's never accidentally done right. one dish. Take a moment. Think yeah, think, you got time. We when got plenty of time. time. He did one dish. Yeah. Just one. Oh, he one did it at his mother's. At his mother's, Elliot. He'll never do a dish for me, but he'll do and it for his mother. About, what was it about his mother that helped him do that dish? What, what was it about being at his mother's that encouraged him? to do that activity that was so delightful for you. They've got a weird relationship, Elliot. How weird? They're weird. weird? She enables him. They're codependent. How does she, how does she do this? So what, you know, watch, is it, look, what is it about what she does? And it's so subtle. Everybody be listening to what he's doing. He's not, Elliot's not taking the bait of the problem talk. He's saying, show me where it didn't exist that way. And it, yeah. by the way, and it probably didn't exist when they were first dating. No. No, and the other way I would have asked the question, or could have asked the question, which is, then essentially, why did you begin to date him? Yeah. If if he didn't do a dish at all in the beginning, that didn't bother you. What was it about him that made you overlook it in the past? I felt bad for him, Elliot. 
He had never done a dish. So you got into a relationship with him because you felt bad for him because he'd never done a dish. Is that right? Yeah, pretty much. It's messed so, up. Well, not really, but what good things were there that caused you to think that was a good idea in the beginning? He's rich. <laughs> and him being rich helped you how? Well, I thought we wouldn't have to do dishes. And then I found and, out it's not his money. It's his evil mother's and how money. Long, how long did the relationship last before you found that out? Oh, six weeks. And during that first six weeks, what was good about it that made you think you had done something good for yourself? Um, we ate out a lot. Oh, where'd you go? Um, JB's. <laughs> and uh, what was your favorite thing about the relationship while you were eating out a lot? He paid attention to me. He liked me. He talked to me. He treated See, so me like just, I was an equal. See, we just went from a problem yeah. description to what she desired. Notice, and, that's right. Know, so now sitting out there on the table are all of these solutions what she wants, huh? Exactly. And now I get to play with those for the next 50 minutes. See, but look at And I made it really hard for you. Most people aren't going to be as convoluted. But you, Elliot, <laughs> I mean, the, this idea, this is why, in a way, it's solution-focused because you, right there, she just threw out four solutions. Yeah. That were that were and exactly. so instead of just being reinforcements of a complaint, they were just they were solution oriented. Exactly right. And now that it's all out there, we know that the relationship worked in the past. And yeah. and you can see how they they would probably in that example, couples would probably disagree on why the problem existed. She would say, "Well, I thought it was his money." And he would say, "Why do you want me for money or so on whatever right. it would be?" And we'd spend months trying to figure that out. Oh, I but love we just it. got to a solution in, in two and a half minutes. And I took you on a dance. We're talking with and Elliot Connie. <laughs> He's a psychotherapist that practices in Keller, Texas. He's teaching us how to be more positive, more appreciative in our language with our partner so we can create solution-focused marriages. We're going to take a, bri- take a break. We're going to be right back and uh, get to a lot more of Elliot's ideas here. He's going to walk us through some habits that are essential to breaking some of this negativity in your marriage. Grab a pen and pencil. We're going to go down the list. This is the Matt Townsend Show. You're listening to us right here on Sirius XM 143 BYU Radio. Welcome back, everybody. The Matt Townsend Show. That's the hoedown music means we're coming up on the first hour. But first, we got to go back to Elliot Connie, who is doing his best to help uh, my little hypothetical person uh, solve their problems. Elliot Connie is a psychotherapist, practices in Keller, Texas. He's the founder and executive director of the Connie Institute and the owner of the Uptown Counseling and Family Therapy Center in Dallas, Texas. He's teaching us solution-building couples therapy. He's teaching us how we can take a more positive approach to um, some of the most basic, you know, marital, even approaches to life. This isn't just about marriage, folks. This would also work with your kids. Instead of getting bogged down into the problem talk, start identifying what it would look like if it was better, what it would look like, examples of it today or examples in the past of where it was more positive or working. So welcome back, Elliot. Again, you can go find Elliot's the author of a book called The Solution-Focused Marriage, Five Simple Habits That Will Bring Out the Best in Your Relationship. You can find that at the solutionfocusedmarriage.com. Okay, Elliot, uh, there's, there's some uh, habit. It's our thinking. A lot of it sounds like with this solution-based approach, it's the thinking and the words that eventually create our problems. Is that right? Um, I, I don't know if I would say that eventually create our problems, but I would say that it's our thinking, our perception, and our our language that can certainly create our pathways towards our most desired outcome. Okay, sure. so this you just turned it all positive. Goodness. <laughs> well, I, if, I, on, I don't man. know what causes problems. I don't spend a whole lot of time studying that, but I can tell you what leads to pathways in the other direction for sure. So what are some things, you know, some habits that we might want to think about in our marriage that, um, that, that will help us to shift that thinking to be a little more appreciative, a little more positive? Okay, well, the first one that I wrote about in my book is having a habit of having a goal for your relationship is so key and so important. Now, I I don't mean necessarily that, you know, you have to sit down and, like, itemize and plot out every single path for your life, 
Right. But I will say it's really, really important to be on the same page about where we're taking this relationship. So we have to communicate to each other, you know, do we want to retire in our 40s and travel the world in a Winnebago, or do, are we going to work as professors until we're 90? I mean, we have to be on the same page about what we're building. So, so it's really so a conversation and, and have a constant kind of a, a habitual conversation about having a goal and knowing and sharing what that goal is. Absolutely. It's a, it's, a, it's a conversation that starts early on in the relationship and continuously checking in. Like, are we still on the same page in our pursuit of these particular goals? Well, what about just having a conversation of what you don't want in your marriage? Um, <laughs> same thing. It goes the opposite direction. To, like, it goes in the opposite direction. Then we I build mean, all of this evidence of what we don't want, which is nuts. If you take a goal that you really want and you start talking about it regularly, and we're well, on the same page. The, right. Think about it from this perspective. If you went to a restaurant and the waiter walked up to you and said, what is it you don't want for dinner tonight? It would take you 10 hours to make your order. (laughs) So So if we sit down with our partner and we say, here's here's the relationship I don't want to be in, it just takes us forever, and it's a difficult conversation to have. If you had a blueprint to build a house of the not dynamics of the the not dimensions of the house, it would... The greatest architect in the world, it would take him forever to construct a house that looked even close to what you wanted it to look Mm -hmm. like. So why don't you just tell people what you want things to look like? Is it that we don't – is it that we don't think we know? I mean you obviously – if you know you don't want something, you obviously know what you want. So it seems like more natural that we would just go to what we want. But Well, I think it's more simple. As Albert Einstein would say, human beings are very, very good at complicating things. (laughs) So when we have this big old brain of ours, one of the things we've absolutely learned how to do is take simple constructs and make them complicated. Mm. So to just tell people what you want is overly simplistic. So I must throw more layers on there. And I really think that's part of what human beings do. Well, maybe it's, it's also because we're – if we've already been triggered and we're already reacting and going fight or flight, we're, we're already skewed negative. So the oh, easiest yeah. thing okay. is just to keep going negative with more negative data. But like a menu, hey, so what do you want for dinner? You know, oh, man, I guess I'll – we're not skewed negative yet. So that might be a little more obvious for us to just do. But the minute you've questioned me and you're calling me names, here we go. <laughs> Game That's on. exactly right. <laughs> That's exactly right. But I think we should stay that simplistic yeah, throughout our lives. That's such a good like a point. A driver like, would never ask me where I'm not going. Yeah. So I should never ask my wife what kind of relationship she doesn't want to be in. It's it, it's funny. Have you seen a lot of couples too that, like I'm a big believer, you shouldn't be telling people what you'd leave them for. <laughs> I'm I mean, a huge believer. It's that like, you not tell hey, there's the, here's what the door looks like. If you want to leave <laughs> me, this is the way out. It's pretty simple. Yeah. 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 It might I'm be better huge. to say these are the 500 reasons I'd love you to stay. That's exactly right. I think I should tell my wife the five million reasons I stay every day. Yeah, I love that. See, it seems so simple, uh, and it, and I guess it really is. So your first one is make a habit of having a goal for your relationship. And I guess, too, it's not – you need to be talking about it regularly. Um, you need to be checking in regularly. Yeah, like how are we doing? Are we still on the same page? Has life caused us to change or adjust any of these goals? And what things do I need from you in, in, as we construct this life? Hmm. Okay, we're gonna t- we have a break at the top of the hour here. We've got to take. We're coming back with Elliot Connie. He's got more solutions, folks. Stay with us. We're going to give you the tools to make sure that uh, we can at least try to start shifting our thinking about our marriage. Hopefully more positively, away from the negative. This is the Matt Townsend Show. You're listening to us right here on BYU Radio. Welcome back, everybody, to the Matt Townsend Show. Second hour coming at you. Up and at them. Wake up, everybody. This guy just broke the board. Some of you may have heard that out in listener land in the middle of our news. Sky messed up. Well, he didn't mess up. I was moving the fader down, and the thing popped off, and it shot the fader up to the top. So it was a burst of music. Let's just look at it positively. I was just trying to wake him up for the second hour. You were trying to wake him up. You're trying to flex your muscles. Yeah, I was, you know, checking him out. It's funny that your muscle's only in that one finger. 
Well, no, no. When I flex my finger, it shows up in my arm, but it's only when I flex that one spot. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, you can see. But it the muscles the... actually appear in my arm. Yeah, it's amazing. Today we're talking about finding a more positive, solution-focused approach to your marriage, and you know, it's not just about being positive, folks. It's about the very questions you ask, the things you think about when you're trying to fix your life and improve situations. You can focus on the problem. And get into it and dive into it and spend 15 hours talking about what doesn't work and then reinforcing it a thousand different ways. Or we can start to identify what it would look like if our relationship was, were healthier, if it were stronger, and open up those discussions. We're joined by Elliot Connie. He's a psychotherapist that practices in Keller, Texas. He's the owner of Uptown Counseling and Family Therapy Center in Dallas, Texas, and has developed the approach Solution Building Couples Therapy. He travels the world speaking at national and international conferences. He's also the author of The Solution-Focused Marriage, Five Simple Habits That Will Bring Out the Best in Your Relationship. You can find information about his book, everything he's got going on, thesolutionfocusedmarriage.com. Elliot, welcome back, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Good to have you. Now, before the break, we talked about one habit that we ought to be focusing on. And, and and directing kind of our conversations around is to have the habit of a of a, a kind of a constant goal for our relationship, something that's very positive about what we want to become together. Uh, yes. uh, you also mentioned something about um, you know taking credit for positive things that happen in your relationship. What let, let's get into that for a minute. Um, what, what do you mean by that? Because we don't want people fighting for the credit, right, of the positive things. No, 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 you, we don't. But we also want people taking credit for the positive things, which we tend to give away. Yeah. Uh, for example, when we have a bad day, we typically use intrinsic things to describe it. Like, I'm having a bad day because I'm crabby, because I'm in a bad mood, and because I, I, I. Mm-hmm. But when we have a good day, we, we very much use vagaries to describe that, and we give it away. So when we're having a good day, it's just like, oh, I woke up on the right side of the bed, or... That we got into this relationship because, you know, karma was at right at the right time or whatever. Right. But the truth is, a relationship requires the constant impl- uh, application of one person's unique talents, strengths, and skills blending with another's. Hmm. And we have to take credit for the process of doing that. But we do it so naturally. We're all built for relationships yeah. that we don't really realize that that's exactly what we're doing. But that's, that is, in fact, what's happening. So as I do things that trigger happiness in my partner, I should accept credit for that. Like, I did something to, to, to manage that happiness to happen in her life and vice versa. And she should take credit for the happiness she's created in mine. Like, literally, we, you, well, we make a big deal. If I've offended somebody, we kind of make – you owe me an apology because you've done something bad and we use all this energy to go get the apology. And all you're right. saying is do the same energy – for something positive. So when somebody does something great and they tell you you're great, don't just, yeah, you know, I want to take it. You know what? I, you're right. I nailed that one. <laughs> nailed it. Exactly right. That's exactly right. And the, and the truth is most of the time we're all really, really good. Right. And we should have the person we're in our lives most with pointed out. Oh, so true. It also seems like if you're going to be taking credit for it, you're actually going to be looking out for it more. Well, a skill you're more aware of, you're more likely to utilize. Yeah. So if I'm more aware that I have particular skills that lead to a desired outcome, then I'm more likely to utilize them on a daily basis. And how many people do you think are more aware of their flaws than there are their talents? Oh, sure. Isn't that true? A skill you're more aware of, you're more likely to take advantage of? That's exactly right. You're more likely to utilize it. Um. That's why this approach isn't – it's not brain surgery. You're just saying no. instead of focusing on the dark, you know, scary, evil side of life, you could also focus on the bright side. And the bright side isn't – it's literally just the mirrored opposite of the dark side. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And, and some people think they, they finally figure out the problem by knowing the dark side so well, the 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 dysfunction so well. But – you could also – this is the whole movement in positive psychology, isn't it, that instead of just talking about the abnormal psychology, we could also study the people that just feel really good. Absolutely, yeah. I mean we should study the Michael Jordans and figure out how to become them. Oh, totally. Instead of studying the worst basketball player in the world and figure out how to not become them. Yeah. 
I've been studying. We, I got a guy here. You haven't met him yet, Elliot. He, it's his name's Skyboy, and uh, we <laughs> hoop it up a bit. But he's he thinks he knows what he's doing. But I, I take him. It's a clinic. It's a clinic, and I just. <laughs> I'm tired of it. I, so I, yeah, I need to focus more on Michael than the clinic. Was there you go. Yes. <laughs> I'm trying to get it. Trying, Michael. Now I'm going to pay for that later. So uh, <laughs> have a goal. It's interesting, by the way. Notice so far, here's what I'm noticing, that if we have a goal for our relationship and we're talking about it and we take mm-hmm. credit for the positives, so far I see a theme that these are like conversations. Yes. It, it's all language-based. Mm. Language is reality. I like it. You're a man after my own heart, Elliot. Seriously, <laughs> this is this is this is really cool stuff. Uh, give us another one. Commun- okay, so let's get into the communication. What do you mean when you say communicate about progress? Well, if we have a goal and we're more aware of our talents, then as we start noticing, we're taking steps towards that goal. Then we should communicate about that progress. So, like, if we have a, a goal of, you know, we want to save for our first house, we should communicate about how the, the savings account grew over the past month. Mm-hmm. And it's because you saved properly, and I saved properly. And instead of going to Starbucks every morning, we made coffee at home, or whatever the choices were. But we had a goal, we're aware of what we're doing, and by gosh, it's working, and we're moving in that proper direction. Okay, curveball. You ready, Elliot? I gave you a curveball last time, and then we had to – I won't make it this hard. So then the person says, oh, well, that, that's great, Elliot, if it was working. But what if this month we had no money saved, and he went to Arby's 17 times? Right. Okay. How do you so, – so she's saying it's not good. So how do you focus on good when there is no good this month? That's, the answer to that is actually – Stupidly simple, not surprisingly. Oh, rude. Okay. Um, but there's no such thing as all bad. Right. It's, it's, an impossible, it's an impossibility to have all bad. So there must be some piece of it that is progressive, and we have to identify it and give language to that piece if yeah. we want it to grow. E- even if just the progressive is, great, okay, so it was a really bad month for you, seemingly. So what did you learn? Exactly. Or... or um, Wow, he knew to go to what Arby's where they had five burgers for five dollars. Yeah, but he didn't uh, buy those. He, he well, bought the expensive on the menu, one right? and combo meals. <laughs> what man needs two combo meals for lunch? Yeah, but he didn't go to the five star restaurant. <laughs> so if he's yeah. gonna squander money, he didn't squander hundreds of it. <laughs> it could have gone really it, bad. It could have. And there's always all I mean, we use words like always and never yeah. a lot. But the one place where I'll say it's true is it's impossible to have something 100% good or 100% bad. So if someone describes something as 100% bad, you instantly and inherently know they're wrong. There's a piece of it that's good. Well, and you showed us earlier a very strong point of that. He may not have gone every day to Arby's. So this week he may have gone one time where he just ate his sack lunch that you made him. So so if you if you... Don't like like you don't ever take the answer I give you as the truth, like that it's always or it's never. Well, great. So that one time that he didn't go to Arby's, tell me what was different that time. Exactly. And in there, there's positive. There's something good there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Man, it's it really is. Uh, and this is I, I've literally seen this approach change. I bet you uh, thousands of marriages. In oh my, my own gosh. practice. It, it works. It flat out works. Absolutely. I was so excited to write this book for that reason. Yeah. People need the book. And the book, again, is called The Solution-Focused Marriage, Five Simple Habits That Will Bring Out the Best in Your Relationship. You can find it at solutionfocusedmarriage.com. Let's do a couple more. Uh, I guess we got to continue to date, too, if we want marriages to work. What's that about? Yeah. I mean, you know, every marriage counselor on the planet is going to tell you that. But I think... I mean dating as a mindset. Like, when you're dating, you're going to go home on that first date, that third date. You're going to go home, and you're going to put on that outfit you just bought, and you're going to iron it, and you're going to go get a haircut. You're going to put forth your very, very best to win that person over. Yeah. And that's really dating. When you're really so interested in the other person's heart and smile and happiness that you're putting forth your absolute best efforts to generate it. And 
back to what I'm talking about when I say continue. Continue to know that every single day your partner's going to wake up slightly different than they were the day before. And your job is to find that difference and cause that difference to fall in love with you as well. And that requires us to continue to be after that person's heart. That's the, uh, I mean, the dating is kind of the stage where you're going to be having these other conversations as well. I mean, it's, if you have this habitual way, uh, this routine of constantly finding time to be together, that is where you can, you know, kind of benefit and, and, and enjoy the, the communication about progress and and laugh about more of the positive things. Actually having time to do it instead of just being – I mean, sometimes you can't always do it in passing or through a text always. Absolutely. That's right. But when you're dating, like you, you're more creative, you're more positive, you're more – desirous of causing happiness to happen so that there would be another date. Yeah. And we have to continue to do that. Even don't, after a thousand years of marriage, we have to continue to do that. Don't you see that with a lot of your clients where the minute they, um, you know, they struggle at home, but they go on a vacation together and they light it up and things are great. And then they oh come home. So it's almost like when you have the space and time to, to g- get into that, that other person that you two used to be with each other you can unleash some pretty cool potential. And then you come back and... I can't tell you how many times people have said, whatever problems we've just described to you don't occur when we go on vacation. Isn't that amazing? It, it, it blows my mind. It so blows my mind. And, it, and the, the wonderful thing is you could literally do this like five minutes per day. Yeah, this it isn't just has huge. To keep happening. No. It, it sounds like then the cruise industry could really change the world. <laughs> And that's mostly what people say. It's like, this doesn't happen. We're on a cruise. <laughs> Except you gain like 20 pounds, and then you're like, I'm <laughs> fat, and I hate my life. It ain't exactly. pretty. Uh, the, your last uh, one, I think, is function as a partnership. Yeah. What? And what I mean by that is, you know, as I was talking about earlier, everybody comes into the relationship with a set of unique talent, strengths, and skills. And we should apply those talents in the relationship. So, for example, if – my partner's relationship strength or if her strength is saving, which in my case it is, then I should not allow my, my ego to get in the way. Yeah. And I should just allow her to be in charge of that because that's her skill. And if one of my skills is organization and structure, then that's what I should do mm. to apply our relationship and, and get it moving forward. That's the strength. So that kind of goes back to the fact that you have to kind of uh, know your strengths, don't you? That, that's a great conversation is – what are your well? Your strengths, honey, are taking the garbage out and mowing the lawn. <laughs> okay, maybe you're, you're probably saying something more than just an activity. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm saying something much more than activity. I'm saying like, like a literal skill. So if if my strength is I'm neither, then perhaps I should be the one cleaning the kitchen. And, and, in, and in my personal case, that's actually true. I'm much neater than my wife, so I'm the one who does most of the household cleaning and most of the stuff around the house. And I shouldn't allow my ego to get in the way. I yeah, shouldn't right. say, well, that's a woman's job. It, that, that happens to be my strength. I'm much more organized. What if my so, strength so, is sitting on the couch making the remote work? Because <laughs> yeah, a lot of my family can't figure the remote out, but I can. <laughs> Perhaps that person is still single. <laughs> that's exactly, <laughs> that person will not be getting married. Um, it really it, – it's even that is so powerful because it's this, it's this concept that in a marriage – you're bringing together a real partnership, and if you can, if you have conversations where you truly know what are what your strengths are, not just tasks, but like discipline or like my wife's very disciplined. So when it comes to anything that demands discipline, we call my wife on that one. Uh, right. When it comes to anything that involves, I don't know, usually food, but not making it consuming, <laughs> she calls me That's in. Your job. There you go. It's as I'm thinking. I don't. I don't that have. Works. I've got to talk to my wife about this because it's not obvious what my strengths are in the marriage. Huh. You might need to go talk to her about it. Yes. <sighs> that means we're got to talk. <laughs> Sorry about that. I know. How many times have you heard that? I mean, can we do it through text? <laughs> we don't. No, no, no. We have to, have to talk. talk. But that's really cool. Yeah, what you say too. This only it. takes a few minutes, right? You. Some of this. Yeah. You could even have a running list of what's working or a running list of what you love about your wife and, and just keep oh. adding to that list. Absolutely. I think 
I had a couple ones that they enjoyed making these lists so much that they kept it on the refrigerator and just added to it when yeah. something else popped up. Oh, that's the money right there. I, I used to have that activity called the T-chart where – they would just write, each of them would put their name down and three things a night or a day that they loved or made them feel loved by their partner. And they write right. it down. And literally, you do that for three or four weeks, it's fixed. And, and imagine, honestly, imagine you go to the refrigerator to grab a beer or a glass of milk or whatever, and you see that your partner has noticed something else wonderful about you. Like, yeah. that, it speaks volumes. It goes, oh. it goes a very long way. Huge. Okay, Elliot, give us one more thing. What's the one thing... As we wrap this up, if you had to think of one thing that made the biggest difference, what what would you say is the one thing? The one thing that made the biggest difference? Um, I would probably say... You may have already even mentioned it. I would probably say having conversations about what's working. Yeah. That would probably be the one thing. Have conversations about what's working. It's not that hard, is it? No, it is not. It just requires attention. It yeah. requires focus. It requires effort. That's awesome. Good well, work, Elliot. Remember that problems problems make us talk. Yeah, we have to we have to create opportunities to talk about solutions. And talk isn't bad. Talk is good. Talk is a very good thing. Elliot Connie, thanks for joining us. Go check thanks out. Thanks for having me, man. You're the you are great. We'll for sure have you back. You know, we've got a lot of people to fix around this office, apparently. They told me. I've got a memo today. Um, this, he's the author of The Solution-Focused Marriage, Five Simple Habits That Will Bring Out the Best in Your Relationship. Go check out his website, thesolutionfocusedmarriage.com. We're going to take a break. This is the Matt Townsend Show right here on Sirius XM 143 BYU Radio.